what was it oh, wait, five four three two one go hooray hello everybody who's on facebook and youtube i'm also here live at the argyle Wellbeing hub today and we're still shuffling folks around as we begin our talk today about anxiety and acupuncture so um for those of you who don't know out there in the online world all of you here today do this is of course mental health awareness week and um the topic for this year's mental health awareness week is anxiety and so um folks at argyle wellbeing hub asked me to come and talk about how acupuncture and anxiety get together so um anybody who doesn't know me i'm i'm, I'm dr beth walker graham and um, i'm an acupuncturist and a chinese medical herbalist at elemental wellness which is my practice and i practice out of my home clinic in Tenalt. Um, and our focus at Elemental Wellness, um, our, our tagline, if you will, is educate, empower, and heal. And so because of that, I like that these talks like this are just really important to our mission. Um, and it's important to our business model. So um, a little bit about me. I studied integrative medicine <clears throat> when I was going to acupuncture school. So a lot of that has to do, um, my clinical education was in Chinese medicine, but my um, my didactic or my, my um, uh, my coursework included a lot of Western medicine so that I'd be able to speak with Western doctors about health conditions and things like that. So <clears throat> I kind of have a foundational knowledge in both Eastern and Western medical diagnosis. And so I just wanted to start off today to talk a little bit about what the Western diagnosis of anxiety is. So um, Merck Manual says that it is a distressing or unpleasant emotional state of nervousness and uneasiness often accompanied by physical and behavioral fear responses. And I think it's really important <clears throat> to know that when we're feeling these things, it's not always pathological. Like I'm sitting up here in front of you today, public speaking makes me very nervous. I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling a little afraid. That's all very normal. Um, but um, in order to classify it as a disease or a pathology, which is really common, it has to cross a few, a few barriers first. Um, so um, the DSM-5 criteria or the psychological criteria for an anxiety diagnosis um, it must be that you have difficulty controlling your worries for more days than not for six or more months plus, right? And you have to have at least three of the other following conditions, which are restlessness, easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating, uh, irritability, muscle tension, or disturbed sleep. So. Um, and then also generalized anxiety disorder commonly occurs with alcohol misuse and major depressive disorder and also panic disorders. So these are all part of that Western constellation of what, how Western medicine would look at that. Um, and um, I mean, I know that most people walk through my door, don't really feel particularly educated or empowered <laughs> about their, their health condition, whatever it is that they're coming to see me for. But um, I think it's important because your GP doesn't really have time to talk these things about you that we all have a chance to know, get a little baseline knowledge. So, and I'm happy to answer questions about it. Some of the Western causes of anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder are hyper, uh, hyperthyroidism. So dysfunction with the, the thyroid gland where you have too much thyroid hormone. Um, uh, Theochromocytoma, which is a, a, an adrenal tumor, which essentially just causes your adrenal glands to produce more hormone than is necessary. Heart failure or arrhythmias, asthma and COPD. And I think it's interesting because a lot of brain imaging studies will show you that um, that uh, there's a hyperfunction, so extra function in the frontal lobes and the basal ganglia in the brain that's associated with uh, anxiety disorder. So sometimes this could be associated with neurodevelopment. So like as your brain is developing, this could just be something that your brain has developed into its physiology. So. Western treatments for anxiety. Um, we have so lucky we have somebody here today that's practicing CBT. So I, I should get her up here to talk a little bit more about CBT and maybe at the end she'll, she'll indulge me a little bit, but it is actually one of the most commonly um, prescribed treatments for anxiety. Um, and you see this photo in the, in the bottom right. This is like, you know, thoughts create feelings, feelings create behavior, behavior reinforces thoughts, and this is that cycle. And this is what CBT is designed to sort of counter. And it's really effective. In over 50% of cases, we found that it's really effective to use CBT. Um, it doesn't work for everybody though. And so there are medications that can be used, SSRIs, otherwise known as your standard antidepressant, SNRIs, which actually also include uh, norepinephrine and a little bit of dopamine. So we start talking about those really start begin to affect your neurotransmitters. And so over on the right here, this is an image of a 
a nervous synapse. So this is what your brain does all the time, sending chemicals back and forth, and the chemicals that it uses to send messages back and forth to your body, well, those are called neurotransmitters. And that's what serotonin and norepinephrine and dopamine are, some of those. So um, this is what Western medicine has to offer you. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, when in time we start working with neurochemicals, like neurotransmitters, things get a little complicated. It's, it's hard to find that right cocktail. And you'll find if you go down that path, it's, it's a road to get there with your physician. And it's really important that you work with a good psychiatrist to get yourself those good cocktails. Um, so that, that's the Western medicine. Oh, and then, wait, hold on, I'm gonna go back one. And then benzodiazepines are the other one. And it's interesting, I've found most commonly, the patients that are coming to see me for anxiety are actually patients who've had anxiety for a really, really long time. The only medication that worked to help manage their anxiety was benzodiazepine, like clonazepam, lorazepam, those kinds of medications. And their doctors are now saying, you can't have that anymore because it's really bad for you long-term. And so they come to me saying, what am I gonna do about my anxiety? I need this to sleep, I need this to survive, I don't know what I'm gonna do, and they're very nervous and concerned about it. So um, again, they're really effective for some people, but not something you can take long-term, and it's just, it can be problematic. So um, uh, we're gonna move into the Eastern medicine portion of the lecture. So that's Western medicine, um, but I don't practice Western medicine. I studied it in school for a little while. I, I practice Eastern medicine. I'm an acupuncturist and an herbalist. <laughs> Um, and in, in Eastern medicine, if you've looked at any of my other talks, I, um, I talk a little bit about yin yang and the yin yang theory and basically everything in your body in the world, everything can be categorized into yin or yang. And these are the five elements that we look at in Chinese medicine. And so um, as with everything being able to be categorized into yin and yang, everything can also be categorized into these five elements. So they all have correspondences and they all work together. Um, the syndrome that you hear about in classical texts that most closely relates to anxiety is shan yu se, um, and that is referring to what has been translated to a tendency to worry um, and continuous or excessive thinking. And in Chinese medicine, we don't make a distinction between thoughts or emotions, like it's all same, same. And we view those more as like symptoms than an actual diagnosis. So we don't have like anxiety as a diagnosis in Chinese medicine. Um, these are symptoms. And um, in Chinese medicine, what you find when you're trying to compare Western and Eastern diagnoses as well as there's usually not a one-to-one. -one. So what I'm gonna take you through today are the three most common syndromes that are associated with the symptoms of anxiety. So you might have anxiety and you might have anxiety and I might have anxiety and they can all look very different to me as a Chinese medicine physician. Whereas in Western medicine, it's all anxiety, all the same. So, um, uh, and so, you know, I'm saying things like liver spleen disharmony or heart and spleen deficiency, right? Um, but I just wanna kind of come back here. We're gonna start here at the five elements, right? And we've got wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. And um, <clears throat> these are a little different than the elements that sort of you're used to. You're used to air being in there and there's only four, but it's okay. Go with me on this. This is the Chinese way, right? Um, but for the purposes of this lecture and for Chinese medicine in general, um, oh, sorry. All of these elements also correspond to different organ systems. So you've got liver, heart, spleen, lung, kidney. And these, again, don't one-to-one -one equate. Um, there is no like your kidney is the same in biomedicine as it is in Chinese medicine. There are some crossovers. So we do see some physiological similarities between the systems, but they're very different. They came about in different ways. And so um, when I say things like there's pathology in your heart, like don't go talking to your doctor and worry that you have a cardiac failure or something like that. That's not what we're talking about. But um, for the purposes of th this lecture, we're only really gonna deal with these four elements today. So it's the wood, fire, earth, and metal. Um, and it's really the liver, heart, spleen, and the lung that are important, um, but really, hold on, going back. We're gonna go one step further and we're gonna take it down to, even though there's four elements involved, all of anxiety, all of anxiety comes down to spleen. Because as we said before, it's a disorder of the thinking, right? It's the thoughts, the thoughts that are taking control of our world. And that's where we experience these feelings of anxiety. And thinking is the thought or emotion that is associated with the spleen. So. As we, as we talk about, right, the, the five elements all kind of talk to each other and they affect each other. And I'll go into that a little bit, but um, the spleen in Chinese medicine, again, is not equivalent to the spleen of biomedicine, except um, really where you might talk about 
it does refer to the digestive system. So when I say spleen in Chinese medicine, I'm talking a lot about digestive system. Um, and so in that way, if you think about the immune component of your digestive system and the fact that in biomedicine, your spleen actually houses your lymphocytes and that bit of your sort of like gut immunity. So there's a bit of a crossover, but the spleen is its own thing. So take that as the Chinese medicine spleen. I like to use the capital S. <laughs> when, I'm like, when I'm talking about Chinese spleen, I'm like, it's a capital S spleen. And like biomedicine spleen is like lowercase. Um, but in Chinese medicine, the spleen, it is your chi maker. It controls the blood and the muscles of the body, and it can be damaged by overthinking. Um, lack of activity on a diet that is excessively cold, sweet, or greasy. These are all things that can harm your spleen. Um, and so when we look at what causes like qi and things, this is a quote from the Huangdi Neijing, which is one of our basic texts that we use. It's one of our oldest texts that we study in Chinese medicine. And it's, um, it's very poetic because it's written thousands of years ago, but um, thinking causes the qi to bind. Um, I have other lectures online where we talk about what qi is, qi, 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 but for my purposes, when I use the word qi, what I'm talking about is function, right? So like if thinking causes the qi to bind, it's causing the qi to not be able to function. And you can think about it as a, though it has in fact been bound, as a, like you've got wrists and feet bound. The qi can't actually go about doing its work and, and helping your organs function if it's bound. Um, and, uh, and this kind of ends up being a bit of a chicken or an egg conundrum, right? Because overthinking is both a symptom and a cause of the weakened spleen, which is kind of part of what causes that cycle that we find when we're looking at anxiety, where like with worry comes more anxiety, comes more worry, comes more anxiety. And so it kind of goes around and around, right? Um, and I see this sort of more clearly identified when I, when I look at the Western concept of panic disorder, right? You know, panic attacks are one thing, but people, panic disorders, like people are having a panic attack because they're afraid of having a panic attack. And I think that like nothing says that chicken egg better than that, right? And, and anybody who's experienced any kind of anxiety, whether it be pathological or just normal, will recognize that cycle, right? Um, and so the spleen is the core of anxiety symptoms. And, um, uh, and in Chinese medicine, it's, it's holistic. So like, no one system operates on its own. Um, and so this isn't the only thing that binds qi. The other thing that likes binding qi is the liver. Um, and the liver is the organ that's most commonly prone to qi stagnation is the word we use when we call about bound qi. So in the five element cycle, the spleen and the liver are connected via what's called the controlling cycle. So this connection, um, so when the liver is out of balance, right? And it's usually either through like a viral infection can sometimes cause this or excessive stress or anger um, that can then damage the spleen. And that's when we get liver spleen disharmony, which is one of the primary patterns that we see in terms of anxiety in Chinese medicine. Um, and this connection is really problematic when we start looking about uh, the, within the context of like modern health and how we live our lives, right? because it tends to come with increased exposure to environmental toxins, lifestyle stress, overwork, less leisure time, less contact with nature, and an abundance of processed and sugary foods and difficulty sourcing or prefer preparing fresh fruits and vegetables. So your liver really likes all of those things as does your spleen. And it's hard, it's hard to get that today, the way we live our life. You know, it's great for people thousands of years ago in Chinese medicine to say, you know, like, yeah, stop all that sugary, like you didn't have sugary drinks, like that was obscene, right? Like, you know, walk down to the, you know, uh, the, the market and, and grab your soda. Like, it's just so easy. It's too easy for us today. And our spleen really wasn't, our, our spleen and our liver weren't designed to accommodate that. Um, and then um, the other thing too about the two organs, right, is we go back to that chicken and egg, right? The liver in response to stress craves additional sugar which further weakens the spleen, which leads to more worry, which increases the stress, which goes back to the beginning, the stress on the liver damages the spleen. And we just keep going around and around. It's, it's, it's a vicious cycle, right? Um, but it's the most common presentation that we see in Chinese medicine. Um, the next common pair that we have, there's one of three, right, is the spleen and the heart. And these are connected through the generating cycle, which is the one where they, they kind of feed each other. And this is the second most common pattern that I really see manifesting in my patients, right? And the generating cycle means that if the spleen becomes weak, 
it's going to draw too hard on the heart, which will in turn become weak. Or if the heart is already weak to begin with, it will not be able to sufficiently nourish the spleen. And so, you know, this one has a lot to do with the balance of blood and how thinking and learning and intellectual pursuits tend to deplete the blood. And so, again, with our modern way of doing things, right, so much of our world has gone into heavy brain, right? It's technology, it's thinking, our lives are so much more, you know, cerebral and brain than they are physical and, um, and active in that way. And so this, this feeds this blood deficiency that then becomes the root cause of that spleen heart weakness, right? And this is just one of the ways, again, that, you know, Chinese medicine theory kind of like looks at the brain and things like that. But um, if we end up taxing the blood of the heart and the heart is where we rule our shen, talked about that a little bit, shen is your emotions and other places I've talked about that. It's your emotions, your mind, your spirit, right? But if the heart is weak, it causes disturbances in the way we perceive our world, right? We get a little agitated and we call that shen disturbance. And that just further complicates any other mental health symptoms that we have from this dysfunction. Um, it amplifies that basically. And the last one that we talk about um, is uh, the chi and the, I'm sorry, the spleen chi and the lung chi deficiency. And those are also connected through the generating cycle. And this kind of takes me back to those earlier slides where we were talking about how asthma and COPD can be causes of anxiety disorders. And um, this is where this kind of comes into play for us. So the spleen lung pattern, um, I see this a lot when I'm dealing with children who have food allergies, right? Uh, hay fever and eczema. Those all kind of come together and all food allergies in Chinese medicine are spleen, are related to the spleen and a weak spleen, uh, weak spleen chi. And then the skin is associated with the lung. And so it's sort of, I come into my clinic, I'm always amazed, right? Uh, children come into the office, we have this constellation of symptoms. We've got eczema, we've got, you know, asthma, we've got, um, <clears throat> we've got food intolerances and we've got some mild anxiety. And this happens very young because children's spleens by their very nature are not fully formed or developed yet. So they're more prone to those kinds of spleen weaknesses. But like, this is like my classic youth pattern for children's anxiety. Um, and so it's just another one of those things. It's all gonna kind of come down the track too. You know, it doesn't really matter where it starts. All of these are generating each other. The liver generates the heart, generates the spleen, generates the lung. So this kind of interconnectivity is one of the really beautiful things I think about that five element cycle. So um, that's Chinese medicine. And that's how we look at anxiety in Chinese medicine. But what does acupuncture actually do, right? Um, and I'm gonna kind of go back to the biomedicine just for a little bit, because I, um, if I stand here and tell you that acupuncture unbinds the chi, right? <laughs> or that like it nourishes your blood, like no one cares, right? <laughs> no one cares, that's acupuncture talk. But um, there is a little bit where we can look at um, the autonomic nervous system, which is really where acupuncture tends to shine. Um, because the autonomic nervous system, for those of you who don't know, is part of our uh, fight, fight, flight, or freeze response, or our rest and digest response, might be what you better know that as. And so I'm, I pulled this slide from the lecture that I, I gave um, last fall about stress, because I worked really hard on it, guys, all right? But <clears throat> more importantly, it talks to you a little bit about how that nervous system works. Um, and even though I think beta endorphins isn't gonna make any more sense to you than chi will, it's at least written in Western language for you. So um, uh, this kind of, of nervous response, when, you're, when you start working with the autonomic nervous system, you can see over there the stimulus of the autonomic nervous system is emotional and physical. And this creates that feedback loop. Right. So not only can you stimulate it with emotions and physical things, in the end, you get emotional and physical responses as well, that then stimulate emotional and physical responses that end in emotional. And so we just we can kind of keep that going. And you can kind of you can do it backwards, you can do it forwards. This particular chart is talking about how we use the autonomic nervous system to engage the parasympathetic nervous system, right? Which is that rest and digest. The sympathetic is what happens to you when you're in this anxiety. That is your overactive sympathetic nervous system constantly making you worried and afraid and running and stressed and all that stuff. So one of the things that acupuncture is really, really good at um, is it regulates the autonomic nervous system. Um, and it, it, it goes to the, the hypothalamus via the skin. It activates neurons to release acetylcholine to help you with that, back in that picture, you saw that blue picture, like those nerve synapses, those all require acetylcholine and <clears throat> acupuncture can activate that release 
It enhances vagal activity. Some of you might have heard of the vagus nerve. I know Ed and I were talking about it a little bit ago. Um, very heavily involved in that rest and digest. It's the cranial nerve that kind of comes out of the back of your skull and it, <clears throat> it enervates the gut. It's the only one of your cranial nerves that actually goes down to your digestive system, right? It really uh, reduces cortisol levels, it improves immune function, and it can really help break that feedback loop. Because one of the things it's great at is, of course, putting you that state of rest. And once you're in that state of rest, you're less likely to trigger that anxious state that physically triggers the sympathetic nervous system. So that's the you know biomedicine of how acupuncture works. Um, and um, a lot of you are familiar with this if you've come to my ear clinic. This is the five point protocol that we use when we're treating patients um, at the community clinic that we do here on Friday afternoons. Um, and you can kind of see how when we look at these points, how they relate back to that autonomic nervous system response, right? Um, and I love ear acupuncture because, it, you know, it's, it can be meaningful and it can really help managing symptoms and, and it really helps folks kind of get on with the business of living their life. You know, anxiety can be paralyzing. And this is a great way to just sort of give you a break from that, even if it's just for a day or two, but getting you a break um, from that feedback loop. Um, but one of the things that's missing from this chart, if anybody hasn't noticed, who's noticed what's missing? the spleen. The spleen is missing from this chart, right? And as we talked before, the spleen is crucial to what acupuncture and Chinese medicine can do in terms of how we heal anxiety. And so um, I think that when you're at a situation where your anxiety is now termed pathological, that using ear acupuncture to help ameliorate those symptoms is gonna be great, it's gonna be freeing, it's gonna do all those things for you. But if we're to the point now where we have a diagnosis and we have a pathology to anxiety, you're gonna benefit from the additional things that Chinese medicine can offer. We have herbal formulas, we have nutritional therapy, we have acupuncture, other kinds of acupuncture, body points that are designed to really help you with that root cause, right? That spleen function, to nourish the blood, all of those things are things that ear acupuncture just doesn't really quite touch. So, um, you know, I think if you're suffering from anxiety, come drop it on a Friday. We're here from 12:30 to 2:30. Um, it's free. We'll give you some ear acupuncture. It's going to help manage your systems and if you think uh, your symptoms. And if you think you might need just a little bit more when you're ready, you can come see me in Tainult, and um, there are more points for that. So, that was my talk on acupuncture and anxiety. Um, thank you for coming. And um, I'm gonna stick around for a little bit here and we're gonna answer some questions and then we'll move on to having our little clinic. We're gonna do a little acupuncture clinic here um, at the hub. So um, you can experience a little bit of acupuncture if you want. Um, are there any questions on there, Cass? All right, so um, I'm gonna leave the live stream going for a few more minutes. Does anybody here have any questions that I can answer for you about anxiety, about acupuncture, anything? Just like info dump on you. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Yeah. You want my resources? Yeah, yeah. These are t these are textbooks that I, I, well, I mean, the Merck Manual is the Merck Manual. It's just sort of the standard Western diagnostic um, tool that we use. And then um, this is the top one, the, the Chinese Medical Psychiatry is a great book that I've got, but it's, it's a textbook that's really like a clinical manual for how we treat psychiatric disorders using Chinese medicine. And then the Foundations of Chinese Medicine from Machiocha, that's like one of our basic textbooks. We get that our first year in Chinese medical school. It goes over the basics of how the organs correspond and things like that. And it's a big silver book <laughs> that we use. And um, yeah, I mean, they're very, they're very cool texts. And then I just wanted to make sure that I had good knowledge about how the NHS really likes to talk about things like CBT and anxiety. So those are my resources. <clears throat> Does anybody else have any questions? No? All right. Cass, you can go ahead and close down the live stream if you want to. Thanks for joining me, guys. Um, it will be replaying. You can see it at YouTube, at my YouTube channel. Um, if you go online and search for Elemental Wellness, you'll find I've got a channel on all of my videos and talks. Do you have a, do you have a question? Yeah, you can shut it down. Maybe that's fine. I'll go in and edit it in the back end.